Hi, guys, girls. My name is Casper. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, most likely, I won't be your favorite guy today here. Uh, I work for government, and I help actual nations to become better, not to destroy them. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes I feel myself that I'm stuck in the middle. I'm stuck in the middle of two different worlds, uh, and there are both ways why they don't like me. When I'm with you in a decentralized world, I love to see how we can trust the platform, mathematics, encryption, each other, not some centralized authority, how it increases transparency, how it lowers bureaucracy. It's all great. I'm managing director of the e-residency in Estonia, so on the other hand, my daily job is to help nations to become digital, to become borderless, and most like, likely I have helped your nation also. Uh, and I see a lot of benefits of a nation state as well. Actually, I like many regulations, but nations do. Uh, when it comes to privacy, even if EU is a lot damaged. I like about uh, antitrust laws, how to avoid uh, monopolies. I like I can come here and I can roam using the same fees on internet. I can travel without needing a passport. There are many things which I do like about organizations and nations, but at the same time I feel and I support most of you that it can't kind of continue as it is because the dissatisfaction increases and we don't trust them so much at all anymore. And something needs to be re-transformed. But my logic is that instead of destroying and building something from scratch, I'll try to help them where they are. So, uh, and uh, throughout my f last four or five years while I'm running this, there have been already some pilots where we have examples of decentralized applications, for example, and Ethereum uh, blockchain, uh, which work together with uh, uh, nation state services. Mm. On the left hand side, uh, Oracle is, has made a way how you can check whether someone's identity is also valid in government side, in any smart contracts. On the right hand side, it was just developed last month, I think. It won actually one uh, Berlin competition. Uh, where you can actually do smart contracts uh, uh, using uh, uh, digitally signed uh, digital identities approved by governments, which means that all of those smart contracts are also legit in uh, policy world, in government world, uh, and, uh, and it increases transparency through this blockchain. And it, it has some different values, uh, why they have done it, for example, uh, they brought out in their blog that when you lose your card, you can get a new one at the embassy, so your digital identity remains the same, uh, even if you lose your private keys of your wallet. But what interests me more is that what else can you do? What else can you do if you would like to help nations to succeed in becoming digital? And uh, what I will do now is I will show you that a 10-phase roadmap, which I see can happen with nations. It's like one path, which I see that uh, may take place in the next 50 to 100 years' time. And, and if you consider this big picture, then please do think how and where you can see you can be relevant to help uh, succeeding those nations who try, try to make the change happen. So, 10 phases of uh, digital uh, nation-state steps um, I'll bring to you. Phase number one, where most nations are today, faking to be digital. I, I'm from Estonia, so I never experienced those, but I heard that people have still those fax machines, and you do signatures on paper with ink. Uh, so, for us, it's we managed to skip that phase after becoming re-independent in 1991. We didn't really have those technologies. 
because it's quite funny. You print out PDFs and then you feel it and then you scan it and then someone, I guess, gets it from other scanner and then needs to feel it again on computer uh, with signature, which you can't verify whether it's correct or not in the first place. So. Not the real good mood uh, and steps, uh, but the most nations are here today. Switching to digital. In Estonia, it happened in 2000, so 18 years ago. A meaning that besides nations recognizing you and uh, uh, true identity, they also allow you, as we have saw in Estonia's basic human right, to recognize you on the internet also. So every, every person managed to have a digital identity. Uh, a uni unique identifier on internet. And uh, each of us have that. Uh, my digital identity is 3871217296. And I'm not afraid of having a unique ID. We can't misconfuse privacy with name. Like, you know, my name is Casper. You can't kind of misuse the name. You know my digital name. You can't misuse that. Uh, just computers are better knowing numbers than characters. Uh, and each have private public key there. Uh, each transaction which we do, where we enter, is encrypted. All the data is encrypted. Only I can decrypt it. I own my data. Whoever checks my data, if they have permission, I will see that through a blockchain-based system. Uh, and if there wasn't a real case why they had to use my data, then it's a criminal case and uh, it ends up very, very badly for them. Digital identities was launched, like I said, 18 years ago. First five years, no one used them for anything because there weren't there any services. Uh, after five years, first service started to appear and now literally everything is online and digitally available. Uh, tens of thousands of services. Phase number three, which Estonia entered, uh, a few years later, like 15, 16 years ago, is data exchange. Something in the infrastructure layer which nations mostly have failed today. This is the screenshot of Estonia. It's decentralized way how government is built up and how data is kept. Each of those green nodes, like I said, is a separate uh, entity where uh, my data can be there. Uh, but as told, uh, we have done regulations so that privacy is, uh, is taken seriously and we own our data. Uh, if we want to transact, why it's useful to have a decentralized way is for many reasons. First, uh, there is no single point of failure. Second, uh, it's very efficient. It is very scalable. Uh, if I give you some examples uh, of the services, what we can use. For example, two days ago, I updated my driver license. I logged into one of those nodes. I gave access to the driver license entity to access my healthcare records, that uh, my eyes are still all right, to access my picture for driver license, to access uh, my age, whether I'm eligible to drive, and where I live, uh, because it needs to be in driving license. I could have done that without giving them allowance to access my data. I needed to do that then manually, physically, but they gave that access. They put everything together, and the next day, yesterday, I got my driver license by just digitally signing and accepting that. I went and see whether uh, it's in a log which shows of that transaction. And like that, all of the services. The magic is that most of the services which we need to use in government side needs data uh, from different departments. If you declare taxes, it asks data from tens of different sources about I allow access my salary, my property, how many children I have, what's my salary, etc. It calculates everything together and I digital sign and I have declared my taxes. So for us, it's been there for quite some time and it works. It's always been working. And, uh, and for us, besides having unique identifier, the data exchange layer has been a very important factor for the success of our digital society. I put together one slide, uh, as many nations uh, where I'm trying to help them uh, 
try to do something similar, but don't understand how to do it. And I see that the very first thing is for us all to make this level of awareness there. Awareness that it is possible to be digital so that privacy and security is protected more, a lot more than paper-based worlds. Like, how do you know who checks today your healthcare data? Who owns your healthcare data? Who changes anything in your healthcare data? You don't have any transparency, any visibility, anything to change. With digital-based systems, there is, and with technology like blockchain and encryption, we can have that trust to keep our data how and how we exactly we want it to be. The level of acceptance. This comes most because people are not ready and don't give permission government to do anything digitally, and that's why they really lag behind. Legislation, data private protection acts, privacy acts, digital signature acts, all of this legislation needs to be in place before government starts to become digital. Infrastructure, data exchange, as I showed you, digital identity, and then the services come. Usually, governments are starting from top down. They start building some services and start figuring out the rest later, and that's why they fail. Phase number four, becoming borderless. This happened in Estonia 2014, and I started to run this uh, program called EU Residency. This means that every person on the planet voluntarily can have and apply to become an e-resident of Estonia, to become our digital citizen. And you obtain the same digital identity as uh, Estonians have, and you can access the same system, same services. When I launched that four plus years ago, I didn't exactly know why you should like to become an e-resident or why should we do it in the first place. So it was more like a government acts like a startup manner, trying to understand your needs and trying to do everything that you would love it. Throughout those years, we have changed 10 plus laws for you. We have developed many services, changed all the processes. And now we are in exponential growth rate throughout the last years of people who become digital citizens of our nations and, uh, and using some systems. Mostly people use our uh, business environment. Last talks you have heard also about the financial exclusion problems. Today, if you're coming in like 70% of nations today can't offer financial services to their citizens. So people become e-residents of Estonia. They uh, put, set up a business within two clicks. They establish banking accounts and they can start selling their services or products globally the same day, having access to Apple Play stores, to Googles, etc to really empower the financial inclusion through this platform. And it's possible and it's scaling. And for us, the motivations are, of course, different. In some ways, for a nation, it's an economic project because we increase our economy, we offer our services to them, we get some money from that, so it, it, there are incentivized to do it. But for us, and for me personally, of course, it's more about, about something to give back to those who lack in digital society, who lack of those services. And as we have this platform, it kind of doesn't hurt us to offer that globally. And I see that now there are two other nations who have joined and opened up and uh, offered the residency to others. And they see that uh, one day everyone will. Nations will understand that they don't need and they don't have to serve only those citizens who they own in that land. They can have service and offer those to everyone, and whoever wants can start choosing them. And I see that if today I'm a resident of some nations, after seven years I'm a resident of at least ten different nations. I'm opting into nation like a service, and opting out if I don't like that nation. I can choose the nations where I want to belong to myself. Some because of the good services, it can be healthcare, it can be business environment. Some because the values of the nation matches my values. I wouldn't become a digital citizen of many nations today because the values don't match. E residents like this environment because of hashtag transparency, encryption, and environment suits them. Phase number five, which happened a few years ago, 
is moving to the cloud, meaning that because of Vienna and different laws, uh, governments need to keep their citizens' data inside the government. What we did to hack this system is that now we have embassies internationally, but in, the, in those embassies we don't have people who work there, as usually, because in embassies it's Estonian land and regulations in that foreign land. But we have data centers. So if something happens, let's say politically correctly, national disaster, and then we can just one, click one button, and not only our service uh, data is backed up, but all our services would keep up and run. So without physically Estonia being there, I would still register my marriage there. I would still elect on, uh, during voting days who will be representing me and my voice. I would still pay taxes even to my nation. So you can't eliminate one nation anymore. All the rest of the five phases we didn't, haven't exactly achieved yet, but so you can be much more critical about the, those phases, but I just see that in some form they can happen. Next, what I want to do is building an app store of a nation state. And here, of course, together with your help also. Nations are very bad in R&D and in development and in engineering in the first place. Like most of the services in, in Estonia, like they are nothing compared to what you can do. And because the bureaucracy and the systems are not, just not built for that. So what we have done and started now is offering a wide range of APIs so that you can build all the services for nations instead of nations themselves. We have APIs to authenticate, to digital sign, to establish a company. You can have your own website where you establish EU company through your residency and have your own environment in different languages, you name it. And I want to do that all the services which nation offers should be offered through APIs as well. Phase number seven, I believe, is the first phase when actually nations don't harass you and you don't feel that they demand something from you. It's uh, becoming invisible. If you give allowance to do something uh, with your data, then there are many things which we can automate. Today, if my child was born, I logged in and uh, I still registered the kindergarten position place, I still registered social welfare systems. All of those things can be made automatically. If I become 65, pensions can be and should be done automatically. I don't need to apply those things. All of the life cycle of person can be automated so that you don't feel at all that nation is on back. Phase number eight, tokenizing the ecosystem. This is what I wrote on a blog last summer, uh, launching our uh, tokens called S-coins, uh, and I had three, four different use cases how to use that. Some were that as companies and organizations want to raise funds the same way I feel that people could be part of a society actually and have stake on that. If society develops and if you believe in society, you buy those tokens. Those tokens then could be used inside the ecosystem to exchange value the same way. Those tokens could be used even to authenticate instead of plastic ID cards. And I wrote many different use cases and, uh, and we tried to search more what and how to evolve with that. Phase number nine is empowering nation through AI. Like AI is a natural part of our lives in private life already. Last time I watched a movie, it was AI who recommended me on Netflix watch, what to watch. Last time I ordered a pizza, it was AI who recommended me pizza place. Went to a restaurant, it was AI, etc. My emails are answered now via AI. The same way, there's no reason to believe that most important national government decisions wouldn't be done or empowered through AI. And there I totally agree with you that uh, so many important decisions are based and done on some 
few people which sometimes are based on emotions and very short-term prospects. And I believe that after 50 or so years, we look back and we do laugh about the situation, how the government is making laws to happen and how the decision-making process is actually taking place. There's so much we, which we can do already today in real time, even when it comes to taxation, which nations love to do, where to lower, where to increase regarding the demand, uh, but also more complex decision-making process. I feel and I do believe that GovTech and AI-based decision-making tools for governments will be very big things in coming years, and we already started to use some of them. And, uh, and one day, if the AI recommends you what to do and you just click the green button, I agree, I agree, I agree. And I do believe that one crazy day we don't need those people to click that red or green button to enforce it, but the system can work on background. And if the system is built on legislation which we support, which, which is done by citizens, and if it is supported by AI and global, then I do believe that, like we have started with some nations like Finland today, already we help each other to offer those services, then it's not like we can see this two ways, whether it's like big brother coming and going to conquer the world, or it's just some software which helps citizens and their decision-making process, and we can use the same software, app layer, uh, for other nations also, we don't need 100 different softwares. Uh, whichever works best, we can start using with our uh, partner nations. So, and where it all ends up as one possibility, if nations don't totally fail, I believe if nations are becoming independent from its own physical land, citizens, services, and start serving humans as never before. Thank you. So yeah, as told, not the mo mostly maybe so popular amongst yours, but if you see that uh, there is a way for not destroying nations, but helping to grow and build them, join the community, become e-residents, help to build decentralized applications on top of that, Help to build applications which matter also more in real world, i.e. where legislation is supporting those. And, and uh, help me to help your nation as well. Thank you.